Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, where we were joined by the incredibly funny, amazing Maisie Adam. Now, anyone who is familiar with our parent TV show, QI, will know all about Maisie. She's burst onto the scene in the last few years, and it is no exaggeration to say that I think she is the funniest newcomer that we've had on QI over the last few years. She's absolutely brilliant. It was a great fun doing this show with her. If you'd like to learn anything more about Maisie, then the best way to find out what she's doing is to go to her website, which is MaisieAdam.com. M-A-I-S-I-E-A-D-A-M. One thing I should quickly mention is that Maisie mentions Ethan in this show. Um, That was a reference to something that happened before the microphones came on, but I had to keep it in. Um, So just to let you know, Ethan is one of the QI elves who does a lot of our tech stuff. Um, If you are a Club Fish member, you might remember his episode of Meet the Elves, where he gave us a fiendish question that we had to solve. We do those Meet the Elves shows every now and then on Club Fish. It's one very good reason one of many in fact that you should subscribe and if you'd like to do that then you can go to of course no such thing as a fish.com forward slash apple and no such thing as a fish.com forward slash patreon anyway one final thing before we do the show today's episode marks the end of our nine months of anna replacement shows yes you got it next week she will be back anna will be back on the podcast so whatever you do don't miss that episode listen to it 10 times you want her to see the figures boosting up when she comes back on the show Uh, but in the meantime really hope you enjoy this show with Maisie. and all that's left to say is on with the podcast Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber, I'm sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray and Maisie Adam and once again we have gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one and that is Maisie. Okay, here we go. The first fizzy drink tasted of urine do with that what you will <laughs> do with that what you will well, not so, drink it that's no. first of all so it was fanta no sorry that's what i'm kind oh, what a wow. slam, slam. Wow. Wow. Ouch. Ouch. expect to cease and desist from fanta offices what a slam on a soft drink that was invented for the nazis was it really fun? Yeah. I believe it was. It yeah. was. But what a good target for me to pick, really, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. If, it was like, you know, if, if you were going to kick one, yeah, yeah, Fanta's the one. I think than... they couldn't get American <laughs> soft drinks, and so they had to make their own. And it wasn't the Nazis, you know, Hitler wasn't on the floor <laughs> sorting it out himself, but it was made during the Nazi <laughs> regime. Oh, okay. I believe. By Nazis. No. For, no. By Nazis, for, for Nazis. Nazis. <laughs> that was the slogan. <laughs> oh, God. But oh, the sorry. first fizzy drink was invented in my hometown of Leeds nice. by a man called Joseph Priestley. But crucially, it tasted of urine. Because people in Leeds... <laughs> we know what we like and we like what we know. <laughs> Here's the crucial question, though. It tasted of urine, but mm. but did it have urine? in it yes it did oh, okay so how did he invent this how did he invent this one accidentally as oh. all best things mm. come about yeah accidentally it was at this brewery he basically accidentally discovered the act of carbonating okay. water right he was a he was like a human soda stream but by accident <laughs> right Brilliant. So he's worked out how to uh, carbonate water. And then what he does is he makes a machine where you can get the CO2 and you can squeeze it into some water and it will make it fizzy. Mm. But as part of that machine, he had a pig's bladder. Yeah. Okay. Just on hand. Just on hand. In those days, it was quite common to have pig's bladders. You know, you used to play football with pig's bladders. It was part of day-to-day life. Everyone had a pig's bladder on (laughs) them. Like a pen nowadays. Yeah. Can I borrow your pig's bladder? Yeah. Yeah. Dan, can I borrow a pig's bladder? (laughs) This one's been chewed. (laughs) So he had a pig's bladder as part of the system and he gave one of his glasses of water, fizzy water, to a friend called John Newth. Mm -hmm. And John Newth said, this tastes like piss. Like, 
you can't sell this to people because it tastes disgusting. It tastes like piss. And he thought that it tasted like piss because it had been squeezed through this bladder. Now, Priestley couldn't taste the piss in his own water. He thought that it tasted absolutely fine. Okay. And he claimed that nude servants were maybe urinating in his drinks because he was such a bad it was, boss. Why? Really, it was a rift between... It really was. In, you know, this is sharing your scientific discovery with a colleague like Nooth. That's a big deal. Yeah. And But Nooth said... In, he wrote a paper... He did didn't even quietly say to Priestley, I think it tastes a bit pissy. He's, he wrote a paper for the Royal Society saying, in some trials which I have made with Dr. Priestley's apparatus, it always happened that the water acquired an urinous flavour. <laughs> That's bad, and it, it? was the it was so predominant that it could not be swallowed without some degree of reluctance. And he didn't run that by Priestley first, just no. going, can I just double check? I'm not the only one <laughs> tasting wee here. Imagine if, like, you know, you've got BO, and instead of your friends yeah. telling you you've got BO, they go to the Royal Society, and that's pretty bad. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and Priestley claimed that many ladies had tried the water, and nobody had complained <laughs> about the urinous flavour. Yeah. It's not looking good for no thing. So does history tell us whether or not his servants were I pissing? Don't, well, we don't know. We don't know. It's, that seems unlikely. But no, And then no one else reported the urine flavour well, outside of Well, then him. Newth invented a new system that didn't have pig splatters in it. Right, uh, okay. Which is effectively was the soda But also, stream. were his servants involved in making it at all? <laughs> Don't, uh, they must have been, to a certain extent. He will have had lab technicians. What was the have, missing yeah. factor when it didn't taste of urine? Was it the servants or the pig's it bladder? It was definitely the pig's bladder. Okay. We're, we're unsure about the servants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this the secret? You know how every one of these companies has a secret ingredient that mm -hmm. we haven't been told about? They've just been hiding piss from us this whole yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> like 11 herbs and spices and piss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, um, just yeah. before we go on on this, can I tell you about one thing about Nooth? Okay. Oh, so yes, John please. Mervyn Nooth. He what wants, a name. It was such a good name. He once had a coughing fit and coughed out a bullet. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, did he kill the person sat opposite him? <laughs> <laughs> so he had this terrible coughing fit. He was like, oh, really coughing awfully. He'd been out and he'd been out in the evening and he thought, oh God, I, and he thought he was going to die. His coughing was so bad. Yeah. This is in about 1799. Um, and he threw himself down on the bed, f coughing with great violence. And then when he got up, he'd coughed out something incredibly hard. Yeah. And um, it, it turned out just before he got ill, he'd been having a glass of wine and then he'd been called away. So he quickly drained the wine. And it had a uh, lead shot in it. Oh, okay. So, okay, right. Not now, a bullet. Not an actual bullet. bullet. But a bit. Uh, okay. <laughs> a lead shot? Still a bit of lead yeah, shot. So yeah, yeah. if you were to buy, um, in the olden days, if you were to buy, like, a partridge for dinner, yeah. they would often have bits of lead in it from yeah. where it had been shot. Oh, Because like, it's like I scatter see. shot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Bullet. Okay, but Shotgun still. Pellets. Okay, yeah, exactly. Shrapnel. Shrapnel of a bullet that yeah. he still swallowed. Okay, so the animal was killed with a bullet. That was in there. Yeah, I think that so, counts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You it As up. a bullet. Come well, it's part of a bullet, right? Do we know of... if coughing up a bullet makes you taste piss? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did That's the part? A great did, point. Where, where, whoever yeah. the bullet went into had that animal wet itself yeah. and it died. Yeah. yeah. Drenched the bullet in wee. He swallowed the. But then, he doesn't notice because of the wine. He doesn't notice because of the wine. Notice. And everyone's like. Pal, have you ever noticed that everything you taste of tastes of piss? <laughs> Maybe you've got a piss-soaked bullet stuck in your throat. In yeah. your taste buds, I don't know. It's wide open. Wow. It's food for thought. Um, so, Nuth then went on and made these soda streams, yeah. uh, which he called gasogenes, or gasogenes. Uh, and they were really famous. And basically, if you were anyone who was anyone in the, when was it, in the 19th century, then you would have a gasogene machine, which was like a soda stream. Not much has so changed cool. really now, isn't it? It's still quite a power move to have a soda stream. It really is. It yeah. really is. So, yeah, I feel, like, I feel like they've, no, I feel like they've recently been overtaken by if you've got an air fryer, that's the thing. Yeah, now, yeah. Air fryer. Mm. But soda streams were a bit of a power move. You look like you've got a soda stream. Got a soda yeah. stream. You can tell by the way you were, yeah, you were brewing like, up to that. I've got one as well. Oh my God. Here's what's embarrassing. It's, it's, it's gold -plated. Mine's gold plated. And we haven't we haven't used it in I think two years now. It just sits there as a display. Why do you have a gold plated soda stream? My wife likes gold things. Is she? Is your house like Donald Trump's yeah. house? Oh my god! <laughs> no, actually, it's probably the only gold thing in our house. On oh, display. is it? Yeah, is yeah. it the only thing? The only thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's not true, Dan. What about the dining table? Yeah, and the oh, toilet and the chairs. Do you Did that, that count? That's real gold. The wallpaper <laughs> and the front of the house. <laughs> And my children. Yeah. Is your wife painted like that woman in gold? Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. what it was with soda streams is when I was a kid, they were really, if 
one of my friends had a soda stream. It was like they were the coolest kid yeah. in town. But now it's because you don't want to buy bottles of yeah. fizzy water because it's bad for the environment or something, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, and you can make super sparkling water as well. Uh, well and you can get the the syrups that yeah. you can make your own tonic water. Coca-Cola. Or, uh, yeah, but it's not Coca-Cola, is it? No, it is. It is. It's, is it real Coca-Cola? Well, well, it's, well, it's not real. It's a, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It is, but it, what Fancy it is. Fancy for all those Nazi parties it has. <laughs> It tastes like the. This is and I, this is a good thing, and I'm I would you know if SodaStream want to advertise on fish, that'd be fine by me. Just throwing it out there, but it tastes like the coke you get on the ferry, you know that kind of coke. No, or at a, like a sort of ferry. like roller cola. It's not Panda completely. Cola. It's it's a bit like that. Yeah, what's roller cola? Like bad cola. Yeah, like, like, like the, knockoff cola. It was oh, like five no. p when Coca Cola was twenty p. Roller cola was five p. I just want to reiterate: this stuff is great. I love it. <laughs> I'm so happy with my Soda Stream. I have used mine in the last I, two years. I actually yeah. don't yeah, think yeah. that Soda Stream are going to have on their advertising like the Coke you get on a ferry. <laughs> yeah, that's nearly as bad a slogan as buy Nazis for Nazis. <laughs> but it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Okay. I use it all the time. Okay. Taste of piss. Yeah. Good. <laughs> As but, it should do. But I am just wondering. like Mummy used to make. <laughs> I think that might be something to do with my servants, though. Mm. I just have a hug. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Priestley, just a quick, uh, yeah. quick yes. word about Priestley. What a guy. Uh, what a guy. So fluent in six languages. Uh, he wrote over 500 books and pamphlets. Um, an amazing that scientist. That sounds like someone who's written 490 <laughs> pamphlets. <laughs> 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 Yeah, 499 pamphlets, one book <laughs> listing all of the pamphlets uh, that you can read. Um, he He's credited with inventing or discovering how oxygen is made up. Yep. Um, he was a lunatic, very excitingly. Oh. So the Lunar Society, which was this thing with Erasmus Darwin and all these amazing scientists at the time, they used to meet when uh, it was a full moon so they could see their way home using the light of the moon oh, in the very cool. dark nights. Really yeah. cool, eh? Yeah, what an extraordinary character. The thing about him being a lunatic, yeah. that meant he was kind of pro-science. Yeah. Um, he was also not of the Protestant faith uh, and he was also kind of sympathetic with the French Revolution and this meant that he had lots of enemies and yeah. lots of people didn't like him mm. and there's a thing called the Priestly Riots so he moved to Birmingham after he left Leeds and they had a dinner to sort of say how great the French Revolution was and a load of people in Birmingham decided to wreck the place where they had the dinner and then go to Priestley's house and wreck his house was he in? Crazy. He was He was in when they started to come with the pitchforks and the whatever. Oh, like proper wreck his house. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh. They did. They did. Yeah. Oh. And his, and his, and his lab, lab. lab in his oh, house. Oh, they didn't just it? knock the lamp off the mantelpiece. No, they he and his went full. <laughs> he and his wife managed to get to the hills so they could see what was happening, but they were away from the mob. But his son was still there, and oh. his son was trying to kind of save everything, and oh, in no. the end he had to flee as well. Wow. And the interesting thing about it is because it was anti-establishment, Establishment, and it was the establishment who were attacking him. We think that possibly some people involved in the Birmingham government might have been involved with this. Right. And Pitt, who was the prime minister then, yeah, he, they asked for help against these um, rioters, and they were very, very slow to react. The government mm. were like, "Oh yeah, we'll help, we'll help," but it was like days and days and days before they sent anyone to Birmingham to help. So really, they were kind of in on it as well. The yeah. government. Wow. Yeah. Just crazy. Or yeah. at least, com- like, sort of passive on it yeah, yeah. yeah. Complicit, yeah. Samuel Johnson called him an evil man like he was really yeah. he was a bit harsh he really did not like carbonated drinks yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's sort of weird to imagine now how controversial it was at the time but yeah it's he support, mad, yeah it? like the French Revolution pro-science well but he also supported the American Revolution yeah. Yeah. and he was a bit um, equivocal on the monarchy and on the idea of virgin birth. Yeah. So it was all. He was quite you know, loved by the American government, wasn't he? When he, he got he? there, yeah, yeah, he was like, very popular. hung out with George Washington. Oh, they love a carbonated drink, though. <laughs> <laughs> they do. You ever seen the Super Bowl? You can't move for Pepsi brand sponsorship. I, have you ever heard of this school around the area of Leeds? Um, oh, I think it's around the area of Leeds. Batley Grammar School? Oh. I know Batley. You know, so I, I would, I would very much believe that they have a grammar school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is where he went to school. Oh, it's a very, very old school, um, obviously, because very old school. he went to it. Yeah, um, and I looked into it to see if they'd produced any other sort of, you know, interesting drinks yeah. through their students, and it turns out that they did. No. Yeah, Richard John Reed, the co-founder of Innocent Smoothies and no. Innocent Drinks, went to the very He's same from school. 
Yeah, he went to Batley, um, Batley Grammar, Grammar School. That's great. Um, and more so than the smoothies, he is sort of the person who is credited with pioneering wackaging. Wackaging. Like yeah. putting the little hats on top, is that what that is? No, it's oh. now when the drink sort of says on the side, Hi, instead of put I'm in the smoothie. fridge. Yeah, put me in uh, the fridge. Oh, oh it wanker. gives the Giving the, yeah, the personalities, personalities to, yeah. to the package. Yeah. Um, it was them, wasn't it, who invented that? Yeah, Before well, specifically, was this guy from yeah. Batley School was wow. uh, credited. Yeah, Richard Reed. I was so pro Batley School until you said that. <laughs> and I think they need mm. to burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> but also, though, as soon as you said it, and you said he was the like inventor of Innocent Smoothie, I immediately just pictured him to be wearing one of those <laughs> knitted hats going around Batley Grammar School corridors in a little knitted woolly hat going Brr, I'm cold put me in the fridge <laughs> oh there's Richard again that's bullying uh, has anyone heard of the soft drink Gullica Pay Gullica Pay Gullica Pay Gullica all oh, one word no it's two words Gullica G-O-L-O-K-A and then P-A-Y Gullica Pay no. no what is it from it's from India hmm Oh no! Oh, oh what? Is it what? urine? It's very urine. Oh no! Yeah. Who's so we is in it? It's cow urine. Oh. Yeah. Uh, five percent by volume, cow urine. Five percent. That's a bit piss heavy for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> we should say we did a fact ages ago about the fact that uh, cow urine is is drunk more over there. Is kind of it's more normalised as a drink, isn't it? Than... Certainly more normalised than it is here. <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> but, but you'd mop but your you floors wouldn't drink with it. it. You wouldn't drink it as just cow urine. It's, it's an ingredient in something. I'm over afraid there. some people do. Yeah, you just drink it straight. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, straight. So it's um... <laughs> no. <laughs> we haven't tried it. No, would you? <laughs> yeah. You would try it. For just to be able to say Ethan, bring in the cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan is um, Dan's gold-covered servant, by the way. <laughs> He's the coming milk. in like Julie Walters with two soups. <laughs> I love that the milkmaid's busy milking the cow one morning. Dan is fractionally behind the milk, pulling <laughs> on the penis. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have said before. There's the Cow Commission of India, and this is um, they're linked to like Hindu nationalist groups, uh, and they think that according to their um, traditional medicine, cow urine is supposed to be an antidote for all sorts of, I mean, anything you can think of inflammation, eczema, arthritis, leprosy. A bit of cow piss sorts it out. A bit of cow yeah. piss is supposed to sort it out. Um, currently, no concrete scientific evidence that it works. But you can buy a soft drink called Golica Pay, which contains 5% urine, but at least it does contain other herbs. That's such nice as to put those in, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, such as Tulsi, Brahmi, and Shank Pushpi, and orange and lemon as well. So herbs, orange, lemon, and cowway. Mm. Yeah, and that's a drink. I'm afraid so. And, and a drink not exclusively used for getting better. You, like some people will just have that on the go. Like Lucozade, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because that is a good illness drink. It's, it's an illness drink, drink, but some people yeah. are having it day to day life. Absolutely. Do you think? Sorry to bring the the tone down on this quite highbrow <laughs> podcast. Do you think the um, do you think they taste wildly different, can we, and pig we? Uh, no, but I reckon probably an expert would be able to. I, I reckon you'll be able to might. learn. You reckon there's to somebody that could that could have a sip of both Absolutely. and be able to point out like how people can point out Coke and Pepsi. Def- definitely. <laughs> Someone, someone's out there the doing it with challenge. doing it with pig and cow. Yeah, because yeah. I could do Coke and Diet Coke. I reckon. Oh yeah, eat oh, yeah. oh anyway, Diet yeah. Coke. <laughs> well, Diet Coke tastes like this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can do tea and coffee. I mean, but, you know. <laughs> oh, Andy, you really thought that was a big wow. thing, didn't you? <laughs> I don't want to brag, guys, but I know the difference. Like like on your first go. (laughs) Coke and Diet Coke are more similar to each other than I think (laughs) you're in a big urine. He's gone. He's gone. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that Brazilian footballer Formiga is the only athlete to ever compete in a team sport in seven Olympics. But when she was born, it was illegal for women to play football in Brazil. This is such a good fact. (laughs) This is such a good fact about such a good player. Oh yeah, do you know about Formiga? Yeah, So and also, as you say, it was illegal when she was born, and so um, women's football wasn't in the Olympics. So that means that she has played in every Olympics where women's football has existed. Right. So... The next, the next Olympics will be the first one in women's football history not to feature wow. for me. Guys. It's Amiga. like if a hundred meters runner had been in every race since eighteen ninety six. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like that, isn't it's it? It's unreal. Oh. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so, like 96 was her first one? <laughs> um, yes. So, she was born in 78, Eight. I yeah. think. Yeah. And Brazil had a law from 1941 until 1979, and they didn't really make it proper until 1981, um, that girls and women were not allowed to play football. But not wasn't just professional. They weren't allowed to play in schools or even play for fun. Yeah. So my daughter wow. on uh, Friday will go to her first football lesson. Amazing. Uh, she's 18, 19 months old. And if she was Formiga, she, it would have been illegal. She could have been arrested <laughs> for going <laughs> playing football. It's, it's mad. absolutely in insane. Because there's a wow. very famous player called Marta, right? Yes. And she wasn't allowed to play football, actively discouraged. She really wanted to. So she used to just on the street, just have uh, balled up bits of um, shopping bags, mm-hmm. basically yeah, yeah, yeah. to use as a ball, playing on her own. Yeah. Then she would sort of sneak in to play with other teams, which were boys entirely. And it was a horrible experience for her. If she ever scored a goal, it was seen as a terrible thing. Like, you've embarrassed that boy. We're trying to make them. It's an attack on the men's sport. And so, never ever was she given this moment of sort of, you know, you've done good. It was an incredible press conference Marta gave because she retired after the World Cup just gone. And it was really quite emotional watching because she's touching on. I mean, women's football across the globe, as we all know, has been hugely under-platformed, under-represented, uh, hugely disrespected as a sport. Bad enough in this country with the FA banning it for 50 years. But in Brazil, as you say, with that very sort of paternalistic moralism sort of society existing, it was an actual attack on... And, it, and it's all down to that it wasn't appropriate for a woman with her build to be playing football. But, um, yeah, Formiga was 19... At her first one, 43 at the last of the yeah. 43 representing your country. And she only ever missed one World Cup, yeah. which was the 1991. Yeah. She's done seven of those really? as well. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, the thing is as well that Marta was um, Brazil's leading scorer mm. in history. She scored 115 goals. Uh, Neymar's the second with 79. Yeah. Uh, Pelé, 77. And Formiga had the highest number of appearances um, which was 234, which is wow. insane. It's unreal, which is more than 100 games more than Cafu, who's got the highest in the men's game. Yeah. And Marta, just what, with the stats, um, she's the current record holder for the most goals ever scored in a World Cup, yeah. in one World Cup, yeah. which is 17 goals. And that's for both men and women's football. That's oh, a yeah, lot. Yeah. Miles for as well. one World Cup, that's a lot. It's mad, Even isn't I it? Know that. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, don't you find it like, like Neymar recently surpassed Pele's. Uh, uh, record and like the the huge uh, yeah, yeah. notice that that gets that it's always like screamed from the rooftops who's the goat in football and we like we always end up talking about men the mm. goats are often in the women's game yeah because they've had to be it's 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 truly incredible I watched I like, sorry, sorry. I, I wa- wa- <laughs> please go on you watch some football. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a, I watched last night, just as a nice bit of timing, um, the series Welcome to Wrexham is oh, yeah. currently yeah. airing its second series. And uh, one of the episodes that comes up mid series, which I watched last night, it's the latest episode as of recording, uh, it was all about the Wrexham women's team. Yeah, so They're good. Isn't far it? better than so any. Good. They, they make it to the, as far as we are in the series right now, they've just made it to the top of their league, but they take on the closest ranking team. And they beat them 11 to 1, I think it was. And Mm. yeah, it's just astonishing. And it's so good, I guess, that it's now changing, isn't it? It's ever growing, but it's thanks to players like Formiga, like Marta, um, like in our own country, like Kelly Smith. Well, even if you go right far back to sort of Dick Kerr ladies, who were all sort of... um, Early 20th century team, Dick Kerr ladies, yeah. Basically the ones pre-war that were getting all of the um, big crowds and then... (laughs) the war happened and everyone was like no we need to make the men feel good yeah so it was banned um in the uk women playing football basically it was they weren't allowed to play on fa affiliated grounds which was all the grounds Mm -hmm. and that ban was from 1921 till the 70s so like you say about 50 years but there was also bans in france in norway in germany and usually the case was that this they thought that sport was unsuitable for the female body, like you say. But in West Germany's case, they specifically said that it was the women's soul that would be in The women's oh, soul! And yeah. I think that's quite nice as a sort of novel way of like, oh, we've had loads of complaints about the 
body and it'll all damage your womb. What are we going to say stuff. then? Yeah, yeah, what are we yeah, yeah, say? Yeah. Oh, they might have meant the sole of their feet, but it's that's, probably, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. how it's spelled. But you don't get footballers who are like, oh, they're not playing this week because they've injured their soul. <laughs> and I, think also, be, I think that would be nice. I think, and also, I think spiritual stuff should be taken. Like the referee should be able to say. <laughs> immoral yeah, yeah 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 immoral play yeah like a stock, I didn't like... see the play but your aura has turned a nasty shade of red <laughs> and just I think just the ref going I'm getting bad vibes yeah exactly red card yeah. <laughs> I think that'd be really fun. Of all the countries as well, to 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 say bad for the soul mm. uh, of a woman, you wouldn't expect Germany. That's not very. It's not particularly Germanic to say, is it? Of, no, of like, not for the soul. Mm. You'd expect that from one of the more romantic language yeah. uh, countries. Nietzsche wouldn't agree. Mm. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> or wouldn't he? I sort of. Um, <laughs> um, here's a, here's the thing. Yeah. So. There was a recent study, and I, like, I quite like this. It's assessed that women's football is better to watch than men's. Uh huh. Um, okay. So it's a Swedish sports company who conducted this. They're called Speedeo, and they compared the women's Euros and the men's World Cup, and they tried to do it as mathematically as possible. So what they found is that women are less risk averse than men in the style of play. And again, no. they're just comparing women's Euros and men's World Cup. So, but that those are two obviously big international. Okay, tournaments. so for instance, the men's teams might deliberately hold back and try and not concede goals, whereas the women's Bingo. team aren't bothered. That's it. So, so in the women's Euros, passes moved teams forward three point seven meters, and in men's in the men's World Cup, it was two point five meters. Really, that doesn't sound like a lot, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's a big old, you know, it's a difference. I, that's I a difference. would love you to be the commentator. <laughs> yeah, on the World Cup. <laughs> And I believe that was a 2.6 metre pass. Oh, yes. Uh, just You're of... running along the sidelines with that wheel, that pizza cutter yeah. wheel. Massive great spreadsheet. I'm trying to keep track of everyone. Yeah, yeah. So is that is that is a it... massive difference? Well, I mean, three, damn, 2.5, 3.7. Sorry, I forgot. It's I'm talking to the man who can tell the difference between Coke and Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> of course you would know the metres differential. That's, that's 50% more oh, per yeah. pass, you know, almost 50% more. Yeah, it's not, it's like 10 centimetres shy of being 50% more, but still, <laughs> but one stat expert said oh, I just love this it's almost like the men are playing a game of chess and the women are playing something a bit more interesting than chess <laughs> <laughs> wow. can I say piss off because actually What's some of us like watching chess like, no, like 3D chess like that they have in Star, Star Wars Trek Wars shit no the, oh yeah it's probably both yeah. Well, it's, it's now we're on my home You're turf. You're all wrong. You, You're all wrong. It's with... Harry Potter 1, remember? Oh, They're on the big yeah. statues. Moving forward. We will get emails just to say in Star Wars, they have the hologram chest, don't they? Oh, with, okay. the, with the monsters. And I think in Star Trek, I don't know what they have. You've lost me here, lads. I'll be honest yeah. with you. You've lost <laughs> me. Go back to back football. football. I think so. Yeah, yeah. It well, is definitely like quite a different game in terms of, like, it feels... At the ground, it's a very different experience watching right. the game. It's a far more inclusive, positive atmosphere. I agree. But actually, on the pitch, that's interesting. So you um, play, don't you? Yeah. How yeah. far do you normally pass? <laughs> oh, I reckon I'm working at the moment with a good 2.7. I would oh, say. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. Now, I think we, we heard a lot in the in the World Cup, a lot of people observing that there was a bit less diving and a bit less sort of... I'm going to get emails here from blokes, as we always do, but going... You know, oh, well, we don't dive. Actually, no. You, you on this podcast, you won't. You, no. you probably get no. quite nice people. No, no, it's the first time. I, I reckon the toxic, learning about football. I, I think the toxic masculinity <laughs> is probably quite low on the list. Oh, listenership me, on I'm here. I'm currently doing the inbox, and I tell you, the number of laddie, is it laddie full of emails. Not we, all men. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing I found about watching women's games as opposed to men's games is that everyone who's at the ground is watching the game. Oh yeah. So like, yeah. In, if you go and watch a men's football match, quite often you're watching the opposing fans. Yeah. yeah. Or what? you know, the, why? Well, you're there. They're to watching you. Yeah. It's... You're kind of singing oh. and chanting. Re rehearsing the chants. Yeah. What's the new chant? <laughs> Let's not go back. To, it's not singing and chanting. It's doing a lot of hand gestures at each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, regardless of what's happening. Unsupported on the pitch. ones. Yeah, right. yeah, it's not, it's not thumbs up. It's not thumbs up, Andy. It's not a heart shape from across. Yeah, because you could. I mean, your whole end of the stand yeah. could do a great big heart. Because if you haven't gone watch, yeah. go watch Leeds, that's what they do. I'd love yeah, it. Know, Andy's yeah. just there shouting across, going, "I love your shirt. Yeah, that's nice. yeah. your shirt. Where's that from?" Um, but yeah, and I went to watch. The, I think it was the World Cup in France, but everyone there was watching the game. Right. right. Literally, no one is doing anything else yeah. yeah but it is interesting to hear the actual clinical differences yeah. of the on pitch uh play maybe if the men's players kick the ball a bit less far or further actually then it might improve the mood in the stands 
Yeah, maybe they wouldn't need Possibly. to make all those hand gestures. <laughs> Mm, maybe. Wow. Uh, formiga is Portuguese for ant. Oh yeah, yeah. She got um, so six legs. <laughs> She's got six <laughs> legs, yeah. and yeah. she can carry and, nineteen times her own body weight, can't she? Yeah, and actually, I just realised that an old word for ant was pissmire because they smell of urine. Oh yeah, oh, oh. look at this. There we go. <laughs> so she's called Ant. That was a nickname that was given to her when she was at school, and it was when she was playing football. They said that she used to play tenaciously and unselfishly, she, much like how an ant would operate within oh. its own colony. Oh. Yeah, oh. so she was very much busy all the time and always oh, that's helping nice. out. Um, and she hated it. Hated oh, it. Really? As a, yeah, as a, really? kid, as a kid, she learned to just accept oh, it. But she said, in the beginning, I didn't like it very much. You know, I thought it, it was weird. That she's small, doesn't it? I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, the actual reason for it is nice, but to be called ant. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, she said, I don't have an antennae. Like, why well, would that's I? That's true. But she's getting a bit hung up on. Yeah. On the, where yeah. are my mandibles? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see if Macy? I wonder if you've seen this movie. Okay. It's called. It's called Titanic. <laughs> Bend it like Beckham. Yeah. Star Wars. <laughs> it's called Escape to Victory. No, I've not seen this film. Has no one what? seen this film? Uh, it's very famous. Is it? I've I had never it. heard of this film before. It stars it Sylvester Stallone, and Pele. Michael Caine, Pele, and Bobby Moore. What? I mean, that is the real expendable. So is it a football, or it sounds like a prison? It is. It is. It is. It's a prison movie whereby... They um, escape through football. They they set up a match, and it, during the match, as part of the that match prep. Them. But I just love there's a Stallone, Michael Caine, Bobby Moore. And That's as, mad. As yeah, I know. Oh my God. Um, I oh, need and, to see this film. I know, I, I really need to see it. Is and it what, any good? Uh, it's a classic. Uh, classic. Yeah, no, I can what read a, between those what lines. A answer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's one of the things I, they used to show it on like Sunday evening. Can I just so. say, if anybody ever went, um, Maisie Adam, I've not seen a comedy, what's it like? And somebody went, it's classic. Mm. <laughs> I think that would be absolutely harrowing. <laughs> You'd rather be made yeah. by Nazis for <laughs> them. <laughs> <laughs> one for the tour poster. <laughs> uh, one last thing on Pele, just oh, yeah. while we're on him very quickly. Um, Pele's last ever match, 1977, he played, and mm. it was an exhibition match, and it was the New York Cosmos against Santos, and um, two teams that he used to play for. So, in order to make sure that he wasn't siding with any particular team, in the first half he played with one team, and in the second half he Lovely. played with the other team. Lovely. Lovely. His final match ever. Absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah. Only Pele could get away with doing that, though. Yeah. I think so. so he didn't change ends. Mm. Oh, oh yes. yes. Which must give you a slight advantage, right? Possibly. Yeah. Also, you... probably being Pele gives you a slight advantage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why he was so good. <laughs> when I was at school, we used to obviously play football for the schools, and a lot of the schools would have pitches that were on massive slants. Oh, my <laughs> God. And so, like, you'd be in the first half, you'd be winning 5 0, and you'd end up losing, like, 21 5. I play in a league in Brighton, and we played on one the other day. You? If you've ever been to Whitehawks Ground, it's a fantastic club, oh, is Whitehawks. Really? But their ground is on a slope, sort of left to right and up to down. Like it's, That's you so could hard. ski oh, down it. Right. You could ski down. There was it. one that I played at at school um, in Bolton. This was, I think, it was in primary school, and it was like slanted, like you say, from one wing to the other. Yeah, you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. And we were all primary school kids, so we didn't really know how to play football, and so the ball would just always end up rolling to the bottom yeah. and all 22 kids <laughs> at the other bottom of the pitch. A lot of corner balls from one specific corner. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. My fact is that American schools have a sport of competitive meat judging. <laughs> no. No. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meat judging. Meat judging. It's less dodgy than it to sounds. Believe. Okay. It's, okay. It's it's made. I think this. Oh, I should say this was sent in by an audience member called uh, Kevin Feegan. So thank you, Kevin. Mm. Kevin is... Feegan. <laughs> Fe Feegan. Yeah. 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 Kevin Feegan. Like Kevin Keegan, but with an F. Yeah. Oh, oh right. right. But he's I, not a vegan. Yeah. I d he didn't say in his email. He's a vegetarian. <laughs> God, come on. Kevin, if, if you're if you American... think I'm better than that, Maisie, you've not had many I episodes. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> Uh, What's Kevin saying? Kevin's saying this. Well, I've just is, that's what it is. That's the fact. That it's meat competitive judging. meat judging, and it's. I think this might be the most American sport possible. How, can, how do you judge meat? What the, what's the criteria? Oh, oh, well, this, is this, this a is, pig yeah. or is it a cow? <laughs> that's step one. That's the absolute baseline. No, no, no. This is okay. It's um, it's a college sport. It's an intercollegiate sport, right? So it's, it's sort of students who are playing it, and um, 
they do, like all over the country teams of students practice all year and then they get to the competition and what you have to do is you're presented with a range of meat carcasses and you have to judge the yield how much meat you'll get out of it how much fat there is in it uh, the consumer experience the age of the carcass and you have to do all this oh. by sight only sight only oh yeah. so they don't just put a slab of meat in front of you and you go pork no. no, 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 no. Not just guess if it's beef you, or pork you barely or lamb. T- I was no, going to say, no, I reckon no. I'd be all right at this. <laughs> Andy, do you think as someone who can tell the difference between diet coke <laughs> and normal coke <laughs> that you would be good at this spot? I think I might. Yeah, I think... Yeah. Um, it sounds amazing. It's, it's like meat chess, basically. It's really <laughs> like... Gosh. You get ten minutes to inspect each carcass. You know, and they're then, hanging up in front of you. You're okay. not really touching them much. You're, you're in looking. like a big cold you're in a fridge. fridge. You're like in a yeah. fridge. You're in the butchers. You're in, yeah, you're in exactly. that. And then, and then you're asked to, to guess yield? Yeah. Um, I mean, all sorts. You, how many, many, how many portions you'd get? My how favourite many? one is, and this is purely by sight, uh, yeah. you have to go and evaluate whether a table of, of 10 cuts that are yeah. laid down mm. fit a checklist of the United States Department of Agricultural Standards. Who's revising this? <laughs> yeah. Oh, people put so much work in. They, tra- they train sometimes for 12 hours a day leading up to the competition. Whilst they're in college? Yeah. Have you seen how expensive college is in America? <laughs> how fuming would these parents be if they knew? They are, you, are, you, are you revising? <laughs> well, I've been looking at my chicken. <laughs> the they must get a scholarship, I guess, right? You know, you like can't if you're get a-, a meat scholarship, <laughs> surely. <laughs> Surely not. They're, you only play. Also, you, they're kind of the it's, competitors. Yeah. They're kind of like the mayflies of the sporting world. They get you get one season. That's it. You can't play twice. You can't play in two consecutive years. Oh, yeah. not like Formiga. Who you can can't play. be the Formiga no, of the meat judge. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Um, Which yeah. is a nightmare for the coaches that pick their, yeah. their star meat exactly. examiners. You train them up for one season yeah. and then they're out. Then you're back. Yeah, you're just back to the start, finding fresh blood. Why you would to- you? Why would you bother? Um, genuinely, why well, would you bother pursuing this if you can't become one of the great meat judges? Well, you can't do it year in year out. There are talent scouts who come to the competitions. <laughs> yeah. You're lying. No, I'm not. I swear. I swear. <laughs> they. They. I mean, a lot of the students are already studying agriculture, that kind of thing. Okay. So a lot of the competitors will end up going into meat professionally. You know, the, the US... Oh, so they might about, be scouted to go into these top jobs yeah, because of how well they did at the meat exactly. judging. Like if the you're the head of, of a meat yeah. company and yeah. you really want the best meat judges to be part of your company, you'll pay lots of money. So I, you'll go to some yeah. intercollegiate competition and be yeah. like, wow... Stephen's very good at kind of clocking. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. And eighty uh, percent of them go into food and livestock industry jobs after college. And that means twenty percent don't know. <laughs> there might be some savants. Twenty percent just doing it for fun. <laughs> They're some going into recruitment. Studying poetry. <laughs> the meat is pure passion for them. And then yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just a side hobby. I just, I just love it. I, I love was, it so much. But you do you do get like the formiga of this, even though the span is just one season. So there is there is one person and called Maddie Ainsley. And Maddie Ainsley did seven competitions, like Formiga. Because around the country, you around go around the, the USA, country, there are yeah. seven different competitions. Oh, okay. Within yeah, the year. Yeah. So this Within is taking up a lot of your year. This is not yeah. like one meat competition. And she won five of the seven. That's she's great. she's seven the all-star. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's great. Um, there's one guy called Rody Hawkins, um, <laughs> who was a former meat judge from Tennessee. And that this is the that only. That can't f- be a sentence. <laughs> Rody Hawkins, meat judge from Tennessee. <laughs> This is it's... like if Chat GPT wrote a novel. <laughs> he was a former meat judge from Tennessee. <laughs> Write an American novel. <laughs> Rody Hawkins from Tennessee. Uh, he's the only famous one I could find who w- went from meat judging to greater things. He co invented Lunchables. Yeah. Which is a famous Sorry. Food they're good. Thi- like, they're like, no, 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 come on. He's oh. judging the quality of meat and he came out with Lunchables. <laughs> What's our Lunchables? It's like a little like plastic it. Processed. <laughs> with, with some squares of processed ham and some squares of processed cheese and some crackers. Oh, right. Yeah, must have been up all night thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> I read a Sports Illustrated article on oh, meat judging. That was great. It's an amazing article, and there's a bit that explains exactly what it takes to enter these competitions oh, and be a meat. So, to be a meat judge, yep. quick decision making, critical reasoning, 
self-assurance, and above all, the ability to quiet one's mind for up to six hours standing in frigid temperatures in total silence. And according to a judge from 2015... Feels like the fourth point is quite a step up. I was like, self-assurance, yeah. And then you read the fourth one, and I was like, ah, no, it's not me. Fifth, ability to judge me. (laughs) Exactly. But what the quote from the judge from 2015 said, and this is to do with the total silence, you have to fight your own demons in the meat judging cooler. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no I, don't, I don't want to fight demons in a meat judging cooler. <laughs> Who are the demons in the meat judging cooler? They're all yours. It's just the internal voices. The internal the voices and, yeah, in yeah. the six hours of silence as you stare and try and well, work out if it's agriculturally there are, sound. There are moments where, so I, this might have been in the same piece, there was a, a student from Texas Tech. She uh, she was called Taylor Shirts. Yeah. She was a um, second year student. What's <laughs> that? Sure. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I do, I think a rom-com set in the meat judging world would be genuinely would be good meat cute a meat cute there we go oh, oh god. god the heads bump over a frozen beef carcass <laughs> <laughs> no so she at one at one point was the foremost meat judge in the country um and i think i don't know what year this was she was competing but there was a competition in houston this just go, sh- shows you how brutal meat judging oh, is no. right she was in the top 10 nationally she was doing brilliantly right. and then she she misjudged the age of one beef carcass no. and plummeted down to 36. Wow. 36 position. So, you know, just... It How can wrong be. Did, she, did she get it really wrong? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, this means it's from 1743. <laughs> <laughs> I think this meat's alive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't relate. But it's it just goes to show it's, oh, yeah, it's yeah. tough. And they, I think it they have tough. some in Australia too. I think there is meat judging there too. Wow. It sounds it's so, like you have to judge the hot carcass weight. Yep. The amount of kidney fat, amount of heart fat, area of ribeye muscle. All from yeah. just looking at it. Yeah. If you got stuck in a freezer, like yeah. one of these big butcher freezers, let's say you kind of, the door closes itself, but you put your foot there to stop it from closing. Okay. Yeah. But then you slip on a sausage or something. Sure. Yeah. And your foot goes out of the way and the door closes. Yeah. It doesn't open from the inside. Yeah. What's the best thing inside the freezer to help you get through that door, would um, you say? Do you know what? the answer? Yeah, this is a real thing that happened. Oh, last. wasn't yeah, wasn't there a guy who beat his Am way I... out with something? <laughs> is, there a, is there a bone? Did, oh, did a he bone. Chisel? Oh, interesting. A skeleton key bone <laughs> that you can. <laughs> yes. the... Yeah, he carves. He has, he's, he's a whittler, and he. Oh, carves you get the wishbone, and you wish that you can. Go... <laughs> Um, it's not having a poo and using the frozen poo to. <laughs> no, oh, Dan, you're in a freezer. Everything's frozen. <laughs> There's no need to have the poo. I think. If what... only I had something to freeze. <laughs> Guess I gotta take a shit. <laughs> That's the only logical thing to do here. Because shit I... my way out. <laughs> Dan, this lift has been stopped for just thirty seconds. Let's wait to see. No, it. no, no! I insist. I'll get us out of this. I must freeze the poo to fashion into a, a presser. To Press the button for help. <laughs> a room full of frozen meats. I'll provide my own tools, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, why did no I never that, broadcast your Desert Island Dex episode, Dan? <laughs> No music for me, thank you, Laura. My next track. <laughs> so, your luxury shit. item is. <laughs> Um, no, it wasn't What that. happened? So, uh, what? This really apparently, happened? Now, this really happened to a guy called Mr. McCabe, who's a butcher. Um, and apparently the beef is too slippery. If you grab a frozen beef, it's kind of too <laughs> slippy to bash your way out. Okay. Um, the, if you get a big sort of chunk of lamb, you can't really, you can't get any purchase on it. And it's often too big. Um, but the perfect thing is a black pudding. Oh. If you get a full black pudding, especially one made by the royal butcher H.M. Sheridan of Balata. Aberdeenshire. Um, these are exactly the right That's size. Specific. Did he tell you this what a, fact? What a <laughs> weird <laughs> secret sponsorship. <we're> <laughs> <like>. <laughs> are you getting money on the side? <laughs> Apparently, it's almost exactly the same size as you know one of those police battering rams that you knock down. Oh, wow! Doors with. Mm. It's like that, and this guy um, managed to <laughs> knock his way out of the freezer, and he said. Um, <laughs> He said, I'm really lucky. We sell about two or three each week, and this was the last one we oh, had. Oh, wow. So wow. if he'd have sold one more, he would have been stuck there That's forever. That's brilliant. Are they buying them as battering rams? <laughs> <laughs> Is that Aberdeen police? <laughs> as he leaves the freezer, he looks back. And he's down in the corner. Daddy, you coming? No, thank you. I'll get myself out. <laughs> 20 more shits. I should have a battering ram out of this. I've got a system. 
the time we went to an escape room with you, Dad. It was... <laughs> yeah, not allowed back there. <laughs> How about this? How about uh, putting a door handle on the other side of the door? Yeah, I mean, yeah. why, why, why do we not? Honestly, most of them do have. Ah, uh, okay, most do. Any that I've been in have got a big red button that you can press and get Ooh, out. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Sorry, how many freezers have you been in that the door's shut and you have to let yourself out of? A couple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I used to work in kitchens and stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Have you guys heard of Retchtub Clat? Retchtub Clat. The rapper. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know what you're saying no. there. Retchtub Clat. 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 How do you spell Clat? K L A T. Oh, this sounds like it's something from the Netherlands. It's actually Australia. Oh, okay. Oh. This is from Red Top. Is it a kind of meat? Of rare meat? Mm, no. Is it, oh. is it a town like one of those weird sort of oh, outback yeah. towns? No. A society? No. It's part of a kangaroo? No. What? Like, is it anything to do with what, anything we're talking is about? Is it a way of cheating at cricket? It's. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. James okay. single handedly lowering our Australian <laughs> audience to zero as the weeks go by. Uh, no. What is it? It is a secret butcher language. Oh, no wonder we haven't heard it. <laughs> it's, a it's a butcher language. There's a That's secret great. butcher That's language. Brilliant. Okay, so what do you think the secret language is? Um, oh, it's in it's in meat displays in the window. So oh, you I arrange see. the, the sausages, a, and it means I'm available. Yeah, it's like a traffic light party, but for butchers yeah, yeah, only. But for yeah. Butchers. <laughs> yeah. Well, the clue the clue is in the name Retchtub Clat. Oh. If you read it backwards, or is it an anagram? Oh, butcher, or it... butcher, but talk butcher. Butcher talk. Oh. Butcher talk is the secret language that is shared. And this has been going since the 1960s. <laughs> Butchers all over Australia use this, and it's been in Australian movies as well, um, whereby they talk backwards to each other so that they can say stuff that the customer can't hear in order to... Um, no. Yeah, absolutely. In Quick, get the age sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so, in order to what? So you might say, on steltuk ni et poos. And that means no cutlets in the shop. And you would say that out loud so that everyone, sometimes a massive butchers in Australia might have 20 butchers the serving people and they would know to just immediately eliminate that as part ah, of the process. I see, but you don't the... upset the customer. Exactly, and you don't want to upset the customer. Uh, on dug kuf ikaf. Oh, good food. Fake. It's no good, fuckface. Oh. <laughs> Really they like that they've worked that out. <laughs> it's pretty like the rest of it, it. Like as the examples, is pretty misogynistic. I have oh. to say. Is it, why is it needed though? Well, largely because if there's a difficult customer, they want to be able to say difficult customer. To, if to be rude about it, feels it. Mis like, but, misogynistically, but customer facing roles that haven't had to do mm. this, has there? Yeah, no, but I guess you're all in one line, and in, if you need to get a message down the line to everyone, hears it in so the shop. So you're sticking up for these sexist butchers. Aren't you? I'm not. I'm telling you that it exists. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying um, to say. That, it's actually in my rom com now, the meat judging rom com. I think there should be a nice, like maybe the lovers speak to each other using yeah bu bu uh, butcher talk, whatever it was yeah. called. Yeah, something yeah. clat. Yeah, wretch tub clat. Wretch tub clat. Yeah, yeah. Nice. subtitled yeah. the entire movie so that you can see what it makes it more classy, I guess. Yeah, yeah it does. then and it, it just says no good fuck face <laughs> along the bottom of the. That's nice and romantic, isn't it? That's the closing line yeah. of the film. That's it. <laughs> and they kiss. And frankly, my dear. <laughs> I undo cooker club. <laughs> okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that the first wireless headset microphone was made for Kate Bush, and it was made out of an old coat hanger. Oh, wow. Mm. First cool. of all, how? Well, you're just making it sort of go around the ears, aren't you? And then you need the perfect bit that actually that you use the hanger yeah. to hang. You would attach the microphone, which would be... Oh, you so know, you're just wearing a, a coat hanger around your head? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. basically those Madonna mics, right? Yeah. yeah. Those steps mics, I would yeah. call them. But yes. Yeah. Britney mic? Britney mic. A Britney mic. mic. It yeah. should be called a, a bush mic, basically, because she she is the, the founder doesn't of it. doesn't quite roll off the <laughs> well, does it? No. At best, you're thinking of a, a problematic president at worst. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking of something much, much worse. 
<laughs> but yeah, so this is so it's interesting to know that we know the very first time anyone wore one of these right. these Madonna Britney mics, and it was Kate Bush. It was on her tour, the Tour of Life, in 1979. It was a song called "Moving," which was the opening number. And the reason that she needed it was because there was so much choreography, there was so much costume change and everything, uh, movement that she needed her hands for everything that she did. She couldn't hold a microphone, so it was one of the sound engineers. Um, two names come up uh, when you look into it. It's a bit hard to nail it down, but uh, one person was called Martin Fisher. Uh, a lot of people said it was him. Some people say it was Gordon Patterson. It was definitely one of the two, and it was on this tour that it was done, and it was done on Kate Bush's only ever tour that she did. Has she only done one tour? She's yeah. never done another tour. She's done a residency. She doesn't like to travel, does our Kate? Oh, really? No. Yeah, she's not into it. Um, and, um, and it's a shame because it sounds like she might have been one of the greatest touring acts that you could ever see i mean this what would, what would she have invented on her future tours exactly yeah. yeah but listen so this this uh the tour of life as i say it was called um this is like a few highlights that you would have seen in that oh show God. right there you go. so it opened with whale song that was playing with kate bush's shadow projected dancing while the curtains were starting to part and revealing the stage right. um and then after a song or two the whole theater was filled with the sound of heartbeats and red lights um there was large oval upholstered red satin egg womb like ball that would be rolled onto stage with Kate inside where she would sing the song Room for the Life as she was rolled around the stage hence not being able to use her hands um, there was a moment where she was singing a song uh, called Violin where she was chased around the stage by two dancers dressed as giant violins there was poetry readings from her brother a magician came out and did an act with a floating wand she came out as a world war Two pilot. She came out as a wild western cowboy esque looking thing with a rifle, and she would shoot ribbons at the, the, at the dancers. Oh I mean, the whole thing with every song had a theme and a production to it, and it was a, a spectacle basically. She's probably still writing the second song. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's yeah, on yeah. One. yeah, exactly. I did go and see. Do you know um, about? What would it have been about 2016, maybe 20, mm, 2015, something like that? Nearly ten years ago, uh, she did a night of about 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 twenty nights yeah, at was, Hammersmith Apollo. Yeah, that was the residency. And me and my mum managed to get tickets. Cool. It was like you know when you get set up all the laptops. Mm. It's like oh, yeah. NASA space station trying to get tickets. F five, F five. We F5. got that literally. We got them, and that was pretty pretty good like it was the first time she performed live in something like 25 years yeah. it was unreal wow. and she flew she flew at the end no she did she flew like so she did she did this song at the end where suddenly like a big crash of thunder happened and I don't I, st I mean obviously she'll have been attached to it so. <laughs> but like no you know you know really? the room I'm talking about the Apollo yeah right yeah. I don't know because she, she wasn't attached to the ceiling directly above the audience but she flew right out to like wow. what looked like touching distance to touching the circle and she's um she's getting I think you know she wouldn't mind us saying this she's getting on his arcade right. like it she's was 50 something I, now, I, I gasped purely out of right. admiration purely out of concern for her welfare wow. as she flew directly towards us we were in the circle oh wow it was uh, like absolutely terrifying and incredible and mesmerising yeah. yeah I think she's in her 60s now blimey yeah yeah was that by any chance Wuthering Heights when she was doing that song no it wasn't that song oh, okay. no no it was like a. it was terror it was, it was a really aggressive song it was like a big crash of thunder and then she just sort of it was I think it was called the dawn of something and she just flew out at us and she, mm. she looked like a big crow and at the time <laughs> did you think she's flying yeah. You did? Yeah, yeah, I did. I would as well with Kate Bush. Yeah. She has mystical qualities. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. It was so good. It Maybe was really, she really did. good. Maybe she invented something. There we go. That we don't have yet, like the Bush rocket, which kind oh, of yeah. flies her up in the air. Yeah, Something hidden. Maybe that's why her. she doesn't tour, because she's like, oh, you know, don't want, don't want everybody to know about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> invented flying, but I don't want to... Oh, <laughs> so she, Kate Bush, shares a birthday with Emily Bronte, who oh, wrote Wuthering Heights? No, which is her, that's interesting. I'm not going to say it's her her big song, but it's one of the biggest, isn't it? That it's is her big. That, that is was big. the breakthrough song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That and, is um, big. 30th of July, uh, 1818 and 1958, respectively. Oh, that's amazing. And can I just tell you a quick thing about the word Wuthering? Oh yeah, yes, please. Sure. What does it What does it mean? Yeah, no idea. Any guesses? Like any Wuthering. 
Weathering Heights. Is it uh, Heights. to fly to the circle That's of it. the venue? That's it. <laughs> yeah. The it's, Weathering Height. It feels onomatopoeically. It feels like weathering almost. Yeah. Like, you know, like the wind, especially because of the book. It feels yeah. like the moors are blowing stuff. And that's pretty much it, is it? But it's pretty much. She, I think, was just about the first to say weathering. It, is it, it was weathering, b- but with a Yorkshire accent? It's that, not. Is it, it's <laughs> with her book it's, dictated, but not yeah. read. <laughs> it, it was previously used much more as withering. Yeah. Uh, with an H, an extra H, or wh- withering, which meant rushing along, and it was usually a reference to wind, like just like you're saying, James. And um, a witherer was def- d- a lusty, a strong, or a stout person. Really? Because uh, like withered now is the opposite of lusty yeah. and strong. And it's again it? with an extra H, so it's wh- a witherer. You know, that was in the Francis Groves dictionary of mm. the, what's the vulgar tongue. His one yeah. was. And, and there was also um, a word to make a whizzing or a rushing noise, which was to wudder. To so it could have been Wuthering Heights, <laughs> which I love. It sounds like something Elmer Fudd would write. <laughs> Wuthering Heights. It does sound like, watch out, I'm watering here. <laughs> um, she hadn't read the book when she wrote Wuthering Heights, Kate Bush. Really? She gets a lot of the plot points in. Yeah, well, she, she must have read the spark notes or something. She'd watched the adaptation on the BBC. Uh, which no. was really big the year before. It was absolutely oh, massive. Cool. And she wrote the book, that wrote the song based on the book, and then later on read the book. Oh, but that's dangerous because sometimes they really change the plot. <laughs> don't uh, yeah, they? Yeah, 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 yeah. I did um, in the uh, A level drama. <laughs> we had to do um, what's that Noel Coward play with Elvira Blythe Spirit? Blythe Spirit. Oh, yeah. In the film, there's a car crash at the end, and I hadn't read the rest of the play, and I just wrote about the car crash at the end. <laughs> and got called into Mrs. Bray's office and she was like so can you just tell me again like which bit inspired you to talk about the car crash scene and oh, I was no. I, I was literally just chatting pure I was woodering on <laughs> and she was like yep yep and so um it's not in the play Maisie it's That's only incredible. in the only in the film and she made me write it all again I had the exact oh. same experience with Winnie the Pooh and the blustery day and <laughs> oh come on in your A-levels <laughs> and <laughs> fortunately the did you the... think Winnie was a poo <laughs> Piglet uses him to beat his way out of a freezer, doesn't he? No, fortunately in my case, the screen adaption was very close to the source material, so I, I got away with it, but it was... it was I, re- I know that fear. Yeah. Oh, I searched on the newspaper archives, um, newspapers.com and the British newspaper archives, for the first mention of Kate Bush. And the first mention I could find was from the Burton Observer and Chronicle, and it was from the week that Wuthering Heights came out, because she was pretty unknown at that stage. And in the first week, it went to, I think, like number 29 in the charts. It wasn't like huge, oh, right. but it was it was there. And um, the, the review said, how do we stop Emily Bronte spinning in her grave? The easiest way would be to call back in all the copies of Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights, mm. singing the role of ghostly Kathy. She appeals for Heathcliff to let her in. If Heathcliff has any sense, he'll plug his ears with cotton wool and go to bed. What wow. a tit. About that, I believe that's the first review of that. Who wrote any, that? It was in the Burton Observer and it was just initials. I think it was said A-H or something so I didn't say who the oh, person was. Oh god, but, yeah. I bet That's... AH is just constantly hoping they never get revealed. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, think, I oh, really it must I be genuinely... a different AH. There was loads of people with AH at the Burton uh, uh, I really tried really to different. look in the Burton Observer and Chronicle history right. to see if anyone who'd worked there had these initials and I couldn't find wow, them. So you I were trying to get a witch hunt going. Oh, I was gonna god. email them and say, what do you think about it now? <laughs> yeah. But this is so weird because there's another connection there. The novel got shocking reviews when it came out. Really? Yeah. Mm. So one said the only consolation which we have in reflecting on it is that it will never be generally read. Oh wow! And another wrote, "How a human Famous being, how a human being could have attempted such a book as the present without committing suicide before he had finished a dozen chapters is a mystery." Wow! wow. I mean, yeah. admittedly, I do own a copy and haven't read it. So, did you not yeah. read it at school? No, we didn't. Really? Not school, yeah. No, we didn't either. No. Really? I read it. I read it. I, it is. It is. Um, look, I'm an Anne Bronte fan. I'm mm-hmm. going to put my cards on the table. Mm-hmm. I prefer Anne. I think Emily's a bit overrated. Wow. Oh. See, this is what we'll Are you get AH? Like <laughs> I'm AHM. Yeah, he, he is. is. Yeah. <laughs> that is his initials. Yeah. I mean, is it possible that AH was paying tribute to he actually or she actually loved the song and just wanted to reflect the original review right. for I the book right. itself? No way. No way. <laughs> no? Seems implausible. Yeah. AH is listening at home going, yes, yes, <laughs> buy it. That was buy that. that was yes, <laughs> please. Um, but a wireless mic born from a, a coat hanger. Yeah. That's exciting, because yeah. now they're, they're everywhere. 
Yeah. They are. Yeah. Um, just on microphones. Yeah. yeah. In the 1930s, the BBC had a special microphone which was only for the use of the royal family. Oh. Okay. And it's in the How BBC to this day. It's an artifact of. So that was when they started doing royal broadcasts at Christmas. I think that was in the 30s. I think yeah, it was George yeah. V who started doing that. Yeah, yeah. And I think a BBC sound engineer saw the standard microphone that they were going to do it with and thought, this is not good enough for the king. Mm. Wow. And just uh, and quickly put some um, you know, regal blue velvet cloth over it, which you would think would slightly dampen the... It might help. It stops it actually the yeah. yeah. Maybe a good point. And anyway, as the years went by, they got more and more elaborate. And so <laughs> they ended up with a, this beautiful, weird-looking thing, which was in a kind of gilded cage. Wow. Yeah. Was it from Dan's home? It was from Dan's home. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. really cool. I was it not... because they worried that, like, non-regal spits might get into it? Or <laughs> no, yeah. I, d- I think it was just that, that we have to make it fancy for the king or queen to use. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kate Bush met the queen. Oh, Went yeah. to Buckingham Palace in 2005. She asked for her autograph. Who asked for whose autograph? Bush asked for Queen. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Queen, yeah. Huge fan. I mean, it's plausible, isn't it? It is That's, plausible. Yeah. And yeah. what did the Queen do? Uh, Fuck I, off. Yeah, exactly. The Queen's not allowed to give out yeah. autographs. I think. Is she not? In case someone tries to do credit card fraud. You're not allowed to, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. Just scamming the queen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, what is it? There she is said, on du kuf e kaf. If you were going to try and scam the queen, you need the mum's maiden name. Yeah, both And often, yeah. oh, she did have an... And then you could, the, the name street, of her street first street pet. you grew up on? Is yeah. it the actual heirs that just have, like, a like first name? Like Charles names? Windsor and stuff like that, I guess. Oh, yeah. Um, I think if you had the queen's autograph, you might be able to start wars against other the countries. Yes, that's true. Oh yeah, that's, that's probably a big that's, thing. And Kate Bush, as we know, <laughs> does more. intent. She does want to do that. She has tried several times. Yeah. I would say that poses a bigger threat as well than just logging into the Queen's Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine anyone called Bush starting illegal wars. That seems very unlikely. No, no. Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. At James Harkin. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. And Maisie. At Maisie Adam. I was up all night thinking of that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing. You can write into us at podcast at qi.com, or you can go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. Do check them out. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be back again next week with another episode, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.